So good morning to everyone that has just joined us and hello to everyone watching the replay. Welcome to another of the PC's online learning webinars. This time it's all about invasive weed management. Are we winning? I am your host Andy Ferguson. Today I am pleased to welcome back my colleague, PCE's Technical Director, Dr. Peter Fitzsimons. We are about to start the main presentation. Just for those that have just joined us, and I can see there is quite a few folks that have just come online. If you do want to ask a question over the course of the webinar, first place I would like to point out to you is to our chat facility on the desktop, should run up the left or the right hand side. Just simply use the, the comment box and hit send. If you um, want to as well, you can email your questions to me at Andy at property-care.org. That's Andy at property-care.org. For those that are watching the replay, um, if you do want to use my email to pose a question, I will do my utmost to try and make sure your question gets answered. That email address again is Andy at property-care.org. So Peter, I can see it is pretty much just turned nine o'clock. Invasive weed management. Um, well, in my limited capacity within the industry, I have to say it feels like a constant evolving process that we're constantly having to learn more and more. It seems like a challenge that we're continuously trying to perfect with invasive plants, continuing to always challenge the different approaches that we're trying to do with it. So what have we learned? What are the emerging threats? How is legislation impacting what we do? And I suppose most importantly, are we winning the battle? Some big questions there, Peter. Over to yourself, good sir. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome. Good morning to everybody. Uh, this this is a, a, a breakfast uh, webinar for, for most of you, but I'd just like to say a particular hello to Heike in Estonia, who uh, reports that it's more of a lunchtime uh, webinar uh, over there. So very good uh, morning still to you, Ika, and to our other uh, visitors from other parts of the European Uni Union. Uh, we have Galina in Dublin and uh, Arjan in Netherlands and uh, a few other folk as well. So uh, welcome to you all. Uh, and thank you for all the weather reports from our uh, UK uh, attendees, uh, plenty of rain around for the uh, parched southeast of uh, England, making everybody very happy. So let's let's crack straight on. Um, so the question has been posed. You know, uh, we've had a professional uh, invasive weed management sector now in the UK for um, quite a while, and um, uh, you know, I think there's been some success stories. Uh, but uh, are we winning the battle? And uh, is there anything we can learn from what's gone on over the last 10 years? This is just a brief uh, intro to me, um, background as, as a botanist, although uh, largely laboratory based rather than um, uh, in the field as an ecologist. Uh, but then I spent most of my career in the uh, property care sector, uh, specialising in biocides uh, around wood protection mainly. Um, so uh, four years ago, I joined the PCA. Um, bringing a lot of that uh, experience and expertise uh, to bear, but uh, I can just barely remember the botany I did uh, when I was a young lad, um, but it's coming very useful over the last uh, five years or so. So invasive weeds, are we, are we winning? Well, uh, 10 years ago, we definitely weren't winning. Um, 10 years ago, um, Japanese knotweed in particular was causing some huge problems uh, in, in the property sector. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was a massive environmental problem as well. Uh, and the PCA, together with uh, a band of uh, forward thinking um, professional contractors in the invasive weed sector, uh, got together to form the Invasive Weed Control Group. Uh, and so what I quickly want to do is just um, discuss those 10 years, what's been achieved, what's changed since 2012, uh, and what's going on now and what's likely to happen next. But just uh, let's look at the big picture first of all. This is just a, 
uh, a screen grab of a, of a Twitter page from the UN Biodiversity um, uh, uh, tweet, Twitter feed. And uh, it's quite a, 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 a significant uh, moment, really, because uh, the Financial Times have uh, written a, a discussion piece about biodiversity loss uh, and very importantly, have given it a, a financial and economic context. And they say, uh, this is a quote from the Financial Times, that biodiversity loss is set to be one of the largest environmental crises of all times. Uh, economies will uh, collapse and societies. And if the financial sector wants to survive, it must move now, fast and at scale. Uh, so we're not talking about uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're not talking about, um, uh, you know, banks and uh, in mortgage interest rates. We're just talking about biodiversity. And when we're talking about biodiversity loss, one of the key drivers for biodiversity loss is invasive species. And this was um, recognized and has been recognized for a long time and formed part of the Kunming Declaration from COP15. COP15's meeting again in Canada uh, in about a month's time. Um, so, you know, we'll get some updates on how the, the global approach to uh, invasive weed control, invasive species control, and biodiversity loss as a general theme is, is progressing. So, you know, we're talking about a big problem, uh, although sometimes, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at it in detail. We, we might lose sight of that bigger picture. So what, what I want to do in the course of the next uh, half an hour or so is just talk a little bit about the evolution of the PCA's invasive weed uh, control group, <clears throat> what we've learned and what we hope to learn going forward, the ongoing threats and, and opportunities uh, for us in terms of delivering uh, benefits in the environment and into in, in the uh, property sector. Talk a little bit about new technologies of weed control. Um, uh, and in particular, I want to talk about integrated weed management and, and just talking about balance of chemical control methods alongside other other approaches uh, and, uh, you know, very much bringing integrated weed management to front and centre of everything that we, we do. Uh, so and then we'll have a quick overview of the legislative framework, which is changing fairly rapidly in the UK and um, how that's going to help us uh, manage the threats of invasive species in the future. And then I'll come back to the, the central question, uh, whether we think uh, we're winning this particular battle. So uh, since the formation of the Invasive Weed Control Group, we have effectively brought uh, order to what was otherwise a fairly chaotic uh, knotweed market. Uh, I call it a knotweed market because essentially what was happening is that uh, properties that had knotweed uh, in, in you know, round about the turn of the last decade um, were unmortgageable, uh, difficult to value uh, because there was so much uncertainty around uh, the problem and the, the, the solutions to the problem uh, and how to underwrite those solutions. Uh, but the PCA together with its members produced a, a code of practice which gave a common uh, consensus about the, the right approach to dealing with Japanese knotweed. Um, we were supported uh, uh, by RICS, who published guidance for their own members, valuation surveyors and, and building surveyors. Uh, and uh, back in 2012, we produced an information paper. Um, we've also had um, an input to their new guidance note published earlier on this year. Uh, see previous webinar. So, um, so we've set norms for the industry to, to bring order to, to chaos, as it were facilitated uh, insured uh, guarantee schemes to give mortgage lenders confidence. We provided a, a framework for professional standards of competence within the industry through training and examinations. And we now have the well-recognized CSJK qualification. I think the number of CSJK qualified surveyors in the UK is running at about um, between 250 and 300. Uh, and of course, we do all the time as part of our remit as a trade association, encourage continuous professional development uh, through the organization of conferences and through things like these webinars. Uh, and of course, every every day, every week, um, we're, we're, we're reaching out to external uh, stakeholders like DEFRA, the Immunity Forum, uh, and making sure we're contributing our experience and knowledge uh, with all of those um, key strategic organizations. 
So these are just some of the documents we've uh, had a hand in uh, helping to produce or producing ourselves. So the original RICS um, information paper, our own code of practice, and then on the right hand side, the new RICS guidance note um, on uh, categorizing uh, Japanese knotweed in, in, in a property valuation context uh, and our own um, uh, guidance notes uh, supporting that document, uh, giving a lot more information about the practicalities of uh, options available for management and control. Uh, but I'm rushing forward a little bit and I must admit I'm assuming that most of you are interested in invasive weeds and know a little bit about Japanese knotweed but uh, I feel I have to uh, just very quickly explain some of the problems that Japanese knotweed has caused not because I want to spend the whole webinar talking about it um, because we'll go on and talk about other other invasive weeds um, but just to give you an idea of some of the the challenges this plant uh, poses all around the world. Uh, it's been a non-native invasive in the UK for about 100, 170 years. Um, interestingly, the problem is caused largely by female plants and the plant spreads only by vegetative means. It doesn't produce fertile seed in the UK. Um, it's described by a Berlin research group recently as a super spreader. So tiny parts of the, uh, the rhizome, underground stems, um, can grow uh, in, in new locations when, when the plant is dispersed. Um, and when it does get established, it tends to produce monospecific stands and will displace native species, produce no uh, ecosystem benefits at all in terms of food for invertebrates. Um, and of course, it has no natural diseases um, at the moment um, in Europe that, uh, that would otherwise naturally control it. So it tends to dominate the landscape where it occurs and, and indeed in property. Uh, it's always been listed in Schedule 9, so there's always been a legislative framework for the control of uh, Japanese knotweed. We'll talk about that later. Um, it's equally at home in the built environment. It seems to like growing around buildings, you could say. Um, it certainly doesn't have um, any, any, any particular problems growing in relatively alkaline environments like uh, uh, through concrete and mortar. Although, it, it, like most plants, it can't really grow through solid structures, but it can exploit cracks and weaknesses. Uh, because of the problems Japanese knotweed caused all those years ago, the Environment Agency had produced its own code of practice, quite a long detailed document, largely about managing uh, knotweed in terms of um, uh, landscape uh, management practice, uh, excavations um, to remove knotweed uh, by physical means. Uh, it's proved to be really, really useful. And around that document, there was a, a coherent professional management sector evolved for the management of Japanese knotweed approximately 25 years ago. And some of our members uh, were very much involved in, in, in advising the Environment Agency and working closely with them all that long time ago. Uh, so, you know, this is just uh, some, some pictures to, to, to put some flesh on the words. Uh, Japanese knotweed crowns on the left there uh, can be quite gnarly, dense, fibrous structures which expand almost like the trunk of a tree so that every year they get a bit larger in diameter and depth and they can cause a certain amount of heave and disruption. Uh, the canes in the middle, um, usually with a stand of knotweed, you'll see some canes going back for two or three years before they finally um, uh, fall over. Uh, but from these crowns, you get new canes produced every year. Uh, so it overwinters in the soil uh, and these canes can themselves be very disruptive and prevent access to, uh, to um, certain sites. And on the right hand side, it's just a picture I took in Northampton Town Centre recently. Um, you know, a stand of nut Japanese knotweed about 50 metres long and about 10 metres deep, uh, just in an otherwise natural uh, setting. Um, and you can just see um, the, the Japanese knotweed at the top of the bank there and that slowly but surely it's uh, excluding uh, there's nothing else growing anywhere near the Japanese knotweed, no teasels, uh, no gallium, no uh, willow herbs or, or, or any of the other normal weeds that uh, occur in the foreground there. They will all be excluded in due course. So the impacts of Japanese knotweed, I think we can summarize uh, in two ways. One is the environmental impact, which is really important. Um, it is a classic invasive species in the sense of uh, displacing uh, native flora and everything that depends on the native flora. Uh, but additionally, because Japanese knotweed occurs in, in rivers, uh, alongside rivers and streams, 
um, a lot. Um, the uh, the dead canes uh, every year, some of them will fall down um, either because of flood events or um, uh, just wind and rain. Uh, and these can uh, be quite persistent in the water and cause blockages at weirs and dams and uh, cause uh, additional flood risks. In the property sector, so we will call it amenity uh, impacts. So around uh, residential and commercial buildings, uh, not we can cause problems with access. It can be a nuisance just purely from the point of view of trying to manage it and uh, suppress its growth. It can cause boundary disputes because of uh, it's it's uh, it, it doesn't recognise boundaries. It quite happily will grow under walls or uh, fences and uh, transgress from one property to another. Uh, and notoriously, it's uh, prone to cause damage to hard surfaces. Uh, I've got a picture here of a uh, patio slabs being lifted by um, some knotweed rhizomes and crowns that have just um, had these patio slabs laid over the top. Um, but indeed, it can also grow through tarmac and, um, and thin uh, other thin concrete surfaces like paths. Oh, excuse me. So, so what's happened in the 10 years since the Invasive Weed Control Group was formed is that, you know, we have a situation where I would say the property market is in respect to Japanese knotweed has been normalized. There's no longer a, a property blight because uh, people recognize Japanese knotweed. They know what threat it poses and what threats it doesn't pose. Um, and therefore, we have a good balanced um, response to Japanese knotweed, both from a mortgage lending point of view and from a, a management point of view. Uh, and then this has solved all of the problems of uh, hiatus that used to happen with property transactions. Um, so all stakeholders uh, have confidence about outcomes now, and this is uh, underpinned by insurance uh, backed guarantees. Uh, so we're constantly evolving best practice for, for the management of Japanese knotweed and produce guidance notes on other species like Himalayan balsam and giant hogweed. Um, we hope that the um, awareness of Japanese knotweed and how to manage it is also helping to reduce incidences of fly tipping. So the sort of panic actions that people might otherwise take uh, in response to the presence of Japanese knotweed on, on their property and also reduce the tendency for people to try and deal with the knotweed themselves, which very rarely ends up working uh, well for, for the owner of the property because uh, uh, the problem just carries on in the future. So uh, by sharing our knowledge uh, and expertise and experience, um, uh, you know, we hope to work with uh, other external bodies to, to stimulate research and contribute to, to research. We'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, and as I said, the, uh, as, as a group, the Invasive Weed Control Group has produced a suite of technical documents, all of which are available free to download from our, from our website uh, and, and a suite of training courses which are being added to all the time. So please do have a look at our training pages as well. Uh, Japanese knotweed in the wild. I mean, we mustn't forget, although sometimes we are a little bit focused on its impact in, in, in the property sector, uh, that actually it is a huge problem in the wild and continues to be so. I guess this is the first time I'm going to address the question, are we winning? And I, I think all the evidence I can see, sorry, this is a bit anecdotal, but uh, rather than scientific, but all the evidence I can see is that we're not really uh, winning the battle that Japanese knotweed is still very much in the ascendancy. Um, and uh, every week I see new stories being shared on LinkedIn, on Twitter uh, and various other media uh, emphasizing the fact that virtually every river, uh, every watercourse, uh, every piece of wasteland or land that hasn't been developed or uh, has been left fallow for a long period of time will have a significant problem with Japanese knotweed or at least one other invasive species. Um, so there's still plenty of work to do out there and I don't think we can claim at all at this stage just in terms of the frequency of occurrence of Japanese knotweed that we're necessarily um, pushing back in any great significant way. I think we're probably just holding holding uh, things in a, in a situation of status quo. But the good news is that at least five or six of our national parks uh, have catchment scale projects for elimination of uh, Japanese knotweed. Uh, they're all at various stages, uh, all using slightly different approaches and methods and uh, some, some are using their, their own staff, some are using external contractors. Um, and perhaps we'll talk a bit about that later when we talk about integrated uh, weed management. Uh, DEFRA are uh, helping to fund research at CABI, uh, 
um, to stimulate the uh, search for buyer control solutions for, for Japanese knotweed. Uh, these may not be a long-term solution for the property care market because they bio control doesn't tend to be a completely black and white solution, which is what people are often looking for. Uh, but certainly in the wild and in natural landscapes, biocontrol could be a really useful uh, weapon. Uh, so I believe there's further trials going on uh, both in, in Holland, uh, sorry, the Netherlands, uh, and in um, uh, looking at uh, uh, other technologies uh, in the UK as well. We'll talk about those later. The Non-Native Species Secretariat, <coughs> sorry about using the um, Abbreviation there, the Non-Native Species Secretariat is a really, really useful um, organisation in the UK. It's a coordinated uh, uh, collaborative group formed by all the different uh, agencies in England, Scotland and Wales. And there's also a, a, a collaboration with uh, Northern Ireland as well. And they have just uh, they, their latest uh, strategy document laying out government uh, approach to non-native species. Uh, was seven years ago so that's being updated it's uh, about to be published i think it's fairly imminent and we'll talk very briefly about that um uh, i've seen the draft uh, i won't be sharing any details with you because i think it's still embargoed um, but we can talk about it in principle so the non-native species secretariat produces a coordinated approach amongst all stakeholders including government agencies um, to help um, share knowledge and experience and uh, if, ensure effective uh, landscape scale invasive weed management <clears throat> and they have uh, they are developing uh, yeah, they've already have an inspectorate uh, element and they're, they're going to try and develop that in the future to, to try and help enforce the legislation so what are the future trends for japanese knotweed <clears throat> well the first thing i'd like to say is uh, if you're looking at the picture on the left there is that Japanese knotweed can be difficult to identify sometimes. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes we show you pictures of Japanese knotweed and you think, well, I can't possibly miss that. It's a very recognizable plant. Uh, but of course, sometimes it's just a green plant growing in a green um, environment. Uh, and uh, you can just out pick out the canes here. Uh, and of course, uh, Japanese knotweed comes in many forms. This is uh, hybrid knotweed, so-called bohemica. Uh, and uh, leaf shape is a little bit different. Uh, the outline of the leaves is a little bit different. So, uh, you know, certainly at early stages of growth, um, it can, can be uh, difficult to pick up or spot if you're looking for the classic spade shaped leaves of Japanese knotweed. <clears throat> but it's just as much a problem in North America. It is definitely uh, the dominant uh, knotweed um, um, type, uh, which is causing a problem. Uh, and, and uh, is starting to occur more often in the UK as well. But anyway, what's, uh, what's been happening more recently um, is that uh, we, we're starting to see more recognition, recognition across Europe uh, for the need for an organized approach to managing particularly Japanese knotweed, but invasive species generally. I mean, there are some very sophisticated organizations through the European Commission um, for coordinating uh, government and research uh, action for for invasive weeds um, but the professional uh, invasive weed management sector that we have in the uk isn't really uh, repeated anywhere else in europe but we're starting to see that happening um, so uh, there are contractors in the netherlands in sweden etc etc uh, and in ireland in particular um, that are um, formalizing and uh, unifying their, their, their approaches and uh, policies for, for Japanese knotweed control. Uh, the Environment Agency responded to the recent Commons Select Committee uh, and were asked to um, develop research priorities through negotiation with organizations like us, the Invasive Weed Control Group. Uh, and you know we've put together a discussion document with them, which is still under review, unfortunately been held up by COVID somewhat but one of the key areas that we've indicated needs to be uh, researched in a lot more detail is the phenomenon of uh, rhizome dormancy <clears throat> to understand it both in the plant generally uh, but also to understand how it's influenced by herbicide treatments for example um, and, and I guess the fundamental question there is um, what are the factors that lead to dormancy being broken uh, over a period of time <clears throat> Uh, I guess it's one of the real big problems with Japanese knotweed is that, you know, you're never really quite sure when it's dead uh, because it can just lie doggo for 10 or 15 years. And, and then anecdotally, uh, we see that um, it can start growing again in the longer term. 
So uh, we've developed best practice and it's uh, based on a holistic approach. So taking all of the available uh, techniques available and putting it all together in, in a code of practice. Um, we're trying to repeat the success we've had with Japanese knotweed for other non-native uh, species, non-native weeds. Um, and, and uh, you know, best practice is developing all the time there as well. Uh, and we'd like to raise uh, awareness going forward for a lot of unlisted species. So we're a bit uh, focused on Wildlife and Countryside Act Schedule 9 and the invasive alien species, uh, species of concern. Um, but of course, there are a multitude of other non-native species which are present uh, and which are not necessarily formally recognised, um, but which are still causing some problems. So here's a good example of one uh, is Russian vine, very close uh, relative of uh, Japanese knotweed, although Japanese knotweed has now been moved into a different genus. Um, they're never nonetheless both part of the Polygonaceae, the, uh, the same family of plants. Uh, and we all recognize Russian vine as being this uh, spreading vine, which produces rather knotweed-like uh, flower racemes uh, about this time of year. And um, if, you know, when we see something like this, uh, you know, we recognize that as being a classic uh, Russian vine uh, situation. But uh, if I tell you that this picture was just one still from a panoramic uh, photo that I took, what you'll realize is that this panorama photo uh, was taken in Oxford fairly recently. And from the left hand edge of the picture to the right hand edge of the picture is about 100 meters. And this is one Russian vine plant running all the way along that hedge over the top of these trees past that building on the right and all the way up to the top of the road. You can't quite see it in this picture, but, you know, Russian vine has completely taken over and dominated both that hedgerow and all of the gardens of all of the properties uh, beyond it. And um, I, I couldn't quite ascertain whether it was one plant or whether it was several plants because uh, Russian vine can self seed. Uh, you know, it will become pollinated and produce viable seed. Um, but every time I see Russian vine, I, I think to myself, this is a classic invasive species. It's very aggressive, very fast growing, non-native, probably doesn't provide any food for caterpillars or moths uh, and uh, you know, ought to be on Schedule 9. <clears throat> but um, it isn't. And, uh, you know, perhaps these, there's an argument for, for looking at it going forward in the future. <clears throat> of course, another one and quite a big debate going on at the moment is, is bamboo. None of the bamboo species, there are literally thousands of them, but I mean, probably in Europe, only a few hundred. <clears throat> All of these bamboos, none of these bamboo species are currently uh, scheduled or listed in any way under UK legislation. But they are um, aggressive, fast growing, rhizomatous uh, plants with classic invasive properties and abilities. They can cause a lot of physical damage like Japanese knotweed. You can see in the bottom center there, the rhizomes extending into a subfloor cavity and starting to grow up behind uh, skirting boards and such like. Um, it does spread to the wild. That picture on the right is one I took on holiday recently down in Devon, that's the southwest of England. Uh, a very big stand of knotweed. Those uh, columns were about five meters tall. Um, and in, a, in an extremely wild uh, habitat next to uh, a river. I can't quite work out how it got there. I think it was fly tipping because <clears throat> it's quite close to a road. Um, and it was completely dominating uh, the area where it was growing. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. Unless somebody uh, does something fairly quickly, I mean, that entire um, river catchment area. Uh, will eventually just be covered in bamboo. Uh, and there's another picture in the centre there, which was taken in in Wales, um, showing pretty much a similar thing. It was actually a hotel garden. They had bamboo, um, you know, failed to get on top of it. And uh, within the space of about 10 years, they only had one plant in the garden, and that was bamboo. So lots of management challenges, very similar to Japanese knotweed in terms of what it does, where it occurs, the damage it can cause, but not currently listed under any legislation. So uh, we need to address that, I think, because uh, bamboo is gonna to continue to be uh, problematic. So we've talked about rhizomatous species. Let's have a quick look at some of the seed dispersing species. Um, you know, quite a lot of our invasive plants are quite happy, can produce fertile seed and do so copiously, which is another invasive trait. 
uh, giant hogweed, uh, Himalayan balsam. We have guidance notes published and available on our website for both those species. Uh, giant rhubarb does uh, produce a, a rhizome system and can spread by, by rhizome, but it also produces a, a lot of seed. The flowering heads, again, just coming to ripening about this time of year, uh, produce thousands of seeds. False acacia is another plant, uh, a woody invasive weed species, um, which you know can spread rapidly either by suckering or by uh, seed dispersal. Japanese rose, um, the seed heads of which are um, you know, quite nutritious and uh, can be eaten by larger birds and small mammals. And then we've got Budley here just above my head, uh, typically growing on, on a piece of uh, railway infrastructure. That's a, a viaduct uh, there again in the center of Northampton. Uh, and uh, Budley, you know, can produce uh, a lot of nectar for insects in the summer. Um, but unfortunately, it also causes a lot of damage to, to masonry structures. It's not by accident, by the way. There is a reason why uh, Budlia grows so well and so profligately on, uh, on masonry structures. And it has a particularly good resistance to lime mortars um, and uh, may even be a calcareous species. So it has a high dependency on lime and finds concrete and uh, screeds and mortar. Uh, a very useful and perhaps even very necessary sort of structures to grow in. So that's a, a quick run through of uh, some of the successes we've had, some of the um, the scope of, of what we've done uh, over the years. Let's just have a quick look at the legislation. I know it can be a little bit um, uh, tedious sometimes, but a quick run through because there are some changes happening that we need to be aware of. Um, can I just say a big plug for Mombrecia, by the way, Crocosmia, just above my head there. I'm going up to Scotland for another short holiday next week, and I fully expect to see entire hillsides covered in this stuff. And, and they will be, because uh, every time I go there, um, I see plenty of Crocosmia. I mean, it has massively escaped into the wild in the west of Scotland. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely dominating the landscape in terms of excluding other species, but given time, um, surely that will happen. Um, we've had the Wildlife and Countryside Act for nearly 43 years um, and uh, you know there's a schedule of invasive species which landowners are required to prevent from uh, growing and spreading. So uh, having the plant isn't against the law but having the plant and allowing it to, to grow and spread is. Uh, and uh, that's still the preeminent uh, legislation within the whole of GB and um, but uh, since then, there's been uh, so a couple of uh, the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, which has been passed in Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, back in 2011, in which they actually state a very similar sort of range of uh, conditions and controls on invasive weed species. Uh, but they state that it is an offence to plant or otherwise cause to grow any plant in the wild outside its native range which I think is an extremely helpful um, phrase uh, to use for legislative purposes. I mean, it's, it had, could cause some problems from a, from a, from a legal point of view um, because people will argue about what is the native range of a, of a particular plant species. I mean, but essentially what they're saying is, well, we don't really need a list of invasive plants. We, we know what's native and what isn't. And if you have a non-native species and it's uh, causing a problem by, by spreading and displacing native species and otherwise um, being a nuisance, then we can legislate against it. So uh, I'm not going to dive into the details of what powers there are under the Wildlife and Countryside Act or the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act. Um, but, you know, we have the legislation to, to, to act uh, on any landowner that is not responsibly managing invasive species, non-native invasive species on their land. And of course, um, whilst all this was going on, we had the uh, EU uh, Invasive Alien Species Regulations come along, which added another 25 or so species to the list we already had under Schedule 9. So currently there are between about 75 and 80 unique species covered by either one piece of legislation or another. Plant species, that is. Uh, but of course, that's that's uh, the environmental uh, legislation because we have legislation which uh, has an impact in the property sector. So these are sort of civil law uh, acts uh, which which help to clarify responsibilities. One is the Anti-Social Behaviour Crime and Policing Act, uh, 
which hasn't changed. It doesn't mention Japanese knotweed, but the guidance uh, for the act um, guiding local authorities and the police and so on uh, about the powers that they can enforce under the act uh, do include uh, invasive species as nuisance. And that includes giant hogweed, not just uh, Japanese knotweed. Uh, and that has now been used uh, two or three times uh, to, to good effect. Uh, in other words, large fines for uh, for landowners who fail to um, manage knotweed on their land when it's causing a detriment to the community, uh, other property owners nearby. We've had the Waste and Williams Network Rail High Court case, which has established precedent for the uh, idea and concept that the presence of Japanese knotweed uh, in the soil uh, can in and of itself uh, constitute a nuisance in law and all of the uh, tort law that comes from the Magna Carta and so on uh, regarding the light, rights of freeholders to uh, free enjoyment uh, of, of their land. Uh, and then we've got the invasive uh, since uh, very recently, so this is um, January 2020, this uh, first uh, hit the headlines, we now have the Invasive Alien Species Enforcement and Permitting Order, which came from the European uh, legislation. And it's effectively the transposition of that uh, legislation into UK law. Uh, and so this uh, basically enhances and uh, adapts and modifies the powers that are available to the Environment Agency, to DEFRA and so on, um, to enforce legislation uh, for evasive weed control. Um, now, what's happened since then is the European list of uh, species of concern has been updated both in 2019 and this year. Uh, and this year they've added uh, Himalayan knotweed to the uh, list of species concern. So Himalayan knotweed now comes under the Invasive Alien Species Enforcement and Permitting Order. Himalayan knotweed prior to that had only ever been on Schedule 9 list for the Northern Ireland, uh, never, not in England and Wales, not in Scotland. Uh, so that's uh, quite a significant change because I know for a fact that many of our members report Himalayan knotweed problems. They find it quite a lot uh, when they're carrying out their surveys. Uh, and that is now uh, a species of concern under the uh, invasive alien species regulations. Um, by the way, the um, Latin binomial there is the new correct one under STACE. So, but you may know of uh, Himalayan knotweed uh, as Polygonum wallichii. Um, but it's not called that anymore, but you might still see that name uh, in um, legislative documents. Uh, we have a, our guidance note on uh, uh, the list of invasive alien species. We'll clarify that for you if you want the details. Uh, and so Brexit happened uh, just prior to COVID, unfortunately. So it's all been a bit confusing over the last two and a half years. Um, but uh, one of the things the UK government has had to do uh, in the aftermath of Brexit is to clarify a lot of uh, legislation, European legislation, which is being transposed into, into UK law. Uh, so we have the order that I've just talked about, the enforcement and permitting order, uh, and they've now published a, a list of species of concern. Uh, now, they, they published in, in England and Wales, the list that they've published separates species which commonly occur uh, which are widespread, I think is the terminology, and all the others. So what they're essentially saying is, um, you know, they would expect there to be uh, management plans in place for the uh, commonly occurring species at the very least. So, um, but in Scotland, uh, just very recently, a similar thing for, for, for the Scottish uh, Parliament, they've now passed the uh, Invasive Non-Native Species uh, EU Exit Regulations 2020. Uh, and in the Scottish legislation, they simply say that the species of concern list is the same as the European list. So that's all 40 of them. Uh, uh, but obviously, uh, only half a dozen or so on the European list will be a particular problem in, in Scotland. And just very quickly, I'd like to say a thing about government regulators. I mean, we've got the non-native species secretariat, which is fantastic as a, as a central um, expertise uh, and uh, communication channels for everybody. They have the responsibility to coordinate the approach to invasive non-native species in, in Britain. And, uh, you know, representative bodies and the Environment Agency, DEFRA, Natural Resource Wales, You've got SEPA and Nature Scott in, in Scotland, and there is a, a liaison as well with the, the mirror organisations now in Northern Ireland. Uh, and of course, they also have around the table and are in, you know, 
contact all the time with uh, research organizations, which are not government organizations, but uh, feed into discussions. You've got the um, Plant Health Authority and the um, Center for Ecology and Hydrology. Uh, and what they do is they produce an, an immense amount of useful information. I mean, I've been um, telling you how wonderful the, the PCA's technical document library is, and it, and it is, um, but there's also a lot of information on the uh, Non-Native Species Secretariat information portal. Uh, they've got a new website, so it's quite easy to navigate and find things. Uh, they have species alerts, fact sheets, management guides, and they have uh, some e-learning uh, opportunities which are free to access. Uh, for people who you know just want to familiarize themselves a little bit with certain species and and, and so on so well worth having a look at uh, and of course the pca are very much involved in their stakeholder forum which has been going uh, for a very long time indeed but the key uh, thing to point out here is that they've um, produced a new strategy document it's still in draft form but it is coming it's going to hit the streets fairly soon i think uh, and, you know, they state in here that the government recognises its responsibility to protect GB's biodiversity, ecosystems, people and the economy from the risks posed by invasive non-native species. So the old 2015 strategy document went through a consultation process. A research report was produced by APEM in 2021. And now the strategy document is ready to be published. And um, I think it's going to be a really useful uh, clarification of, uh, of policy. Uh, and, and the way that the regulations are going to be imposed. So uh, this strategy document and the Common Select Committee approach uh, does depend a lot on it. They're reaching out to voluntary groups, wildlife organizations and so on to, to, to help, if you like, fight the battle against invasive species, uh, which is great. But of course, those organizations tend to have limited resources that rely on lots of uh, volunteer uh, uh, help and so on. Um, but uh, you know, we are we are starting to see some landscape scale based initiatives to take on Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, Himalayan balsam and so on. Uh, we're seeing the water authorities, we're seeing national parks. Um, CC in Scotland is, 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 is a, a really, really great initiative. I can't tell you how much I love the work that they're doing. Um, they produce lots of case histories, which are really good, um, you know, for, for learning purposes. So do visit their website. That's the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, by the way. Um, but the key thing for us is that in the strategy document, they do recognize uh, the potential value of professional contractors in terms of uh, invasive weed management. That is to say that the resources, the expertise, the experience, the knowledge, the qualifications of professional invasive weed controllers um, is and can be made use of uh, in these in these projects. And, and that's happening all the time. And perhaps we can have a future webinar to explore some of those. So as far as the legislation is concerned, just to summarize, there is a lot of legal protection from invasive species, but it's predominantly focused on their presence in the wild. There's an increasing awareness through the uh, non-native species secretariat uh, of, of the, the potential damage and dangers of invasive weeds. Uh, we have initiatives like Invasive Speeds Week, Species Week, Check Clean Dry campaign and so on. Um, and uh, also, we can see that uh, the legislation is helping us to uh, reduce the impact of non-native species in, in the property sector as well. But new invasive weed species are arriving at a fair old rate every year. Uh, I think actually 10 to 12 might be the list of plants and animal species. But never nonetheless, there are big new threats coming along all the time. It's hard to determine at any given point in time just how successful our strategies are being against one particular species. We can only really say how it's working on a particular habitat scale in relation to the project work that's being carried out. And there are a lot of success stories out there, which, you know, we applaud um, and we want to see more of them. But I think nationally it's, uh, you know, we're not really winning yet. Um, there's global trends. It's an increasing threat globally. The UN Biodiversity Committee is meeting again in October to discuss that. So is what we're doing making a difference? Um, yes, I think it is. We're, we're, we're developing knowledge, uh, we're developing capacity in terms of expertise and resources. Um, but what we're learning is that management of invasive species always needs to be a long term project. Uh, there's no there's no short term quick fix for, for invasive weeds. You've got issues like rhizome dormancy and seed bank exhaustion, which 
generally di dictate that any invasive weed control project is going to be a multi-year uh, project. Um, you've got to monitor long term to um, be wary of recolonization by, by seeds uh, coming back onto the site or regrowth from dormant rhizomes. And we need to think carefully about how revegetation re strategies might help uh, to, to re-establish uh, more resilience uh, in, in habitats, particularly wild habitats that have had invasive weeds. And I'm glad to say we're going to have a, a keynote paper on that subject at our conference in November. Uh, so we need to manage everybody's expectations, homeowners uh, and landowners, about what can be achieved uh, rather than giving them false uh, promises about um, finite uh, conclusions. We're talking a lot about herbicide optimization at the moment. Um, it's a big subject. Um, we've done a lot of research on uh, product uh, types of products, the timing and uh, best delivery methods for uh, invasive weed control. There's research going on through Dan Jones's group. Uh, this paper just came out re recently looking at winter heliotrope. Um, and there's been a lot of work in Scotland by uh, CC um looking at uh, white butterbur which is a very closely related species um uh, and then we're looking at integrated weed control in terms of not only reducing herbicide use or optimizing herbicide use but looking at biocontrol in the form of psyllids for uh, japanese knotweed mycocides for himalayan balsam uh and sissy again um you know looking at sort of uh, grazing impact against giant hogweed so apparently sheep love it so um be interesting to see how that pans out on the site they're uh, monitoring up in the northeast of scotland and a couple of quick uh, andy will be pleased to know i'm nearly finished a couple of very quick examples of whether we are or aren't winning this is the island of lundy in the bristol channel where they had a massive 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 problem with rhododendron which had uh, escaped from ornamental gardens and was covering more or less the entire eastern side of of, of lundy um, so they managed to get on top of it largely through mechanical means, you know, chopping it all down, um, treating the, the, the stumps with some uh, eco plugs and, and such like things. Um, and when you uh, do a, a, a float by on a, on a, on a tourist boat, uh, you can take a picture like this on the left where you can see the, the scarring, if you like, of the landscape where there used to be uh, a rhododendron completely dominating uh, that part of uh, land. Um, and you might look at it and think, oh, well, you know, the invasive weed control has damaged the, the vegetation because there's nothing growing there. Uh, but that's not because of the use of herbicide. If you look at the close up picture on the right, you'll realize that actually what's happening is that it's just um, the rhododendron has uh, chemically, there's a lot of allelopathy effects with rhod rhododendron, which causes, um, you know, makes the soil fairly toxic to other plants to grow. And this takes many, many years for for recovery. So uh, what's happening is that the uh, normal native weeds, grasses, bramble and the like are all coming in, but only very slowly. Uh, and, you know, the, the damage caused by the rhododendron, not by the rhododendron control, but by the rhododendron itself, is going to take a long time to 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 be repaired. But that is a win as far as uh, as far as people on Lundy are concerned, the National Trust, the Landmark Trust, uh, that's a win because they've they've got on top of the problem and with a little bit of management going forward in the future they should be able to keep it keep keep that uh, status quo uh, there is some re regrowth from the rhododendron shoots by the way i should say so i mean they do need to keep monitoring the site uh, but here's an example where um, a win is probably almost impossible to achieve because you have the Isles of Scilly um, just off the coast of Cornwall in southwest England uh, and here again, a, a holiday I was on recently. Um, I tend to like going to islands, as you can tell. Um, they have a massive problem because virtually every other plant that you see uh, is likely to be an invasive species. So you have Carpabrotus here on the left, uh, sour fig, uh, just finishing flowering, so it doesn't look very pretty. Um, this was in July, um, but uh, I mean it's, it's everywhere on uh, you know the shoreline, all all the way around the Isles of Scilly, Tresco, St Martins, uh, you name it. Um, and of course, there's um, purple dew plant as well. This is actually growing in a residential uh, context, but it has also escaped to to the wild. So these two succulents, these are succulent species. They're uh, uh, crasulation uh, acid metabolism type species. They're very very much not native to the UK. 
fact, uh, yeah, and, and they're a huge problem. I know also on the Atlantic seaboard of France, Portugal, and, and and a lot of Mediterranean areas too. So these are problems that really need to be addressed in the future, but they're definitely not winning on the Isles of Scilly at the moment. So to summarise, uh, the PCA has done a lot of work over the last ten years. The Invasive Weed Control Group uh, continues to to do a lot of good work, developing, organising conferences, and developing its uh, learning resources. There are lots of challenges ahead. We need to keep a collective approach in mind by liaising particularly with the non-native species secretariat. We're trying to develop new techniques with partners. Legislation is being clarified. That new strategy document when it comes out will help to do that. Awareness of invasive weeds and their control and the problems they cause and their control is increasing. But the challenge is still great. Uh, you know, there's a lot of new species arriving all the time. We need to keep an eye on those. So are we winning? My conclusion is sometimes yes, but there's still a lot of work to do. So thanks for listening and it's over to you, Andy. Oh, well, thanks, Peter. And as always, a uh, very, very interesting presentation. Um, got quite a few questions to come. I just want to actually just comment. And it was quite interesting. You mentioned about the fly tipping issues within with Japanese knotweeds. I remember 10 years ago, actually, maybe a bit longer than that, but it was when home reports came into Scotland and then all of a sudden Japanese knotweed became um, uh, it became something that chartered surveyors to a large degree were then looking out for and there was a real lack of knowledge of it. But I remember a report coming out and it was um, at the old Ravens Craig Steelworks in Motherwell where as more knowledge was coming out and as information was being communicated out about Japanese knotweed, all of a sudden there was just a whole load of tipping that was getting taken place within the Ravens yeah. Craig old steelworks. Yeah. Now that yeah. led to then a whole host of problems for when the new leisure facility was then built there. But it is interesting, like people's habits and behaviours when they see it, they see it as an instant threat, mm. they worry about mm. it, the mm. impact on its property. And that's not just Japanese knotweed. I know, I, I know there is other invasive plants and stuff out there as well. But I, I, I mean, I'd be interested to hear from others um, in the chat whether or not it was a similar case up and down the country if you actually saw a massive increase and on fly tipping as greater awareness of certain invasive plants come out there. But it was also as well, um, it was interesting to hear you, uh, your views in Europe and you mentioning that there's now the beginnings of a coordinated and organised approach to invasive weeds. Now I know um, there's many of our listeners tuning in right now from Europe and I would be very interested to hear from our European listeners how you are finding your country's approach. But following on from a question that Philip Evans um, posted, how do you feel the UK is comparing to other European countries? And is there stuff that we could be learning from Europe or is there key stuff that Europe could be learning from us? Oh, well, always the latter, always the latter. We learn from each other. Um, you know, there, there's there's so much expertise and knowledge across Europe and across the Western world, in North America, Australia. You know, I try to keep in, in touch with, uh, you know, th there are organisations like the Invasive Weed Control Group in most Commonwealth countries. So Canada, Australia, yeah, and New Zealand uh, and so on. Um, and in uh, the United States of America, um, which I very nearly called a Commonwealth country, but I don't think we can. Um, yes, I don't think you can. Uh, but, 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 but as far as I can tell, such organisations don't currently exist in Europe. So there are there are representative organisations at European government level, you know, representing, if you like, the um, invasive weed uh, control um, interests of, of the European mm -hmm. community. Um, but I'm not aware. Please let me know some of our European um, uh, listeners. Um, I'm not aware of such organizations being present in France or Germany or Sweden or so on and so forth. So, um, you know, perhaps that's something that, um, you know, we can talk to them about. But to be honest, all the time I'm reading research papers from groups in, in the Netherlands, in France, in all over Europe, which are really, really important uh, um, 
important work that's go that's going to help us in the UK with with how we manage uh, invasive species. I think the most important interesting thing about uh, the UK is that we have a very unique climate uh, in a European context. Is that um, you know our temperate um, climate means that we have a particularly uh, uh, our weather is particularly conducive for certain species and we seem to be a home for virtually every Himalayan plant that was ever um, ever, ever evolved uh, you know rhododendron Himalayan balsam uh, you know all these things they all come from the Himalayas you know it's no it's no it's no surprise that virtually every other invasive weed is called uh, either Japanese something or Himalayan something because mm. you know they, they seem but it's because of climate it's because of climate. You know, if you go to Japan, if you go to the Himalayas, the climate in the, the foothills of the Himalayas or in, in, in halfway up the mountains of Japan is almost identical to what you have in Glasgow, for example. Mm. You know, wet, mild, you know, not terribly cold in the winter, uh, you know. And, and so uh, whilst certain parts of the, uh, you know, Atlantic seaboard of France and parts of Spain, um, and parts of, say, Norway and Sweden in particular, southern Sweden has a climate almost identical to uh, to Scotland. Um, but um, you know, this this is this is where some plants come become a particular problem because of the climatic similarities. But if you get down into the Mediterranean areas, they've got they've got different plants, but the same sorts of problems, but more drought loving plants or heat tolerant plants. I think I think there's always a degree where we can learn from each other and we can do it. But I'd be interested to hear from um, those that are tuning in from Europe. Um, are you aware of those groups? Can you tell us what those groups are? If you have groups in France, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, then please do let us know. We would be very interested to know and potentially engage. So just stick that into the chat if you get the opportunity. Um, I'm going to go on to, by the way, then, then just to kind of let you know, Peter, if you can try and keep the answers a little bit short because we're running quite short in time. But um, I'm interested in exploring this comment, are we winning? And um, Bruce Osborne raised a comment that um, from all the scientific reviews that have shown plant invasions are increasing despite an increase of control methods, is it a case that we're really only winning the battle within urban environments and in the wild environments. We're just generally losing right now because we're not spending enough time. I mean, what's your view? Yeah, good morning, Bruce. Thanks thanks for the question. I hope you're well. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's a little bit cheeky posing a rhetorical question like, are we winning? Because uh, as I think you've now found out, mm -hmm. I don't really have the answer in terms of any quantitative data uh, because nobody's really measuring or, or monitoring the success. What we can mm. say from the point of view of the property sector, so that's the work that our members are doing to manage and control Japanese knotweed in particular in, in residential uh, scenarios, um, is that there is a lot of success because we know that all the guarantees that are being issued against the works that are being carried out uh, are, are rarely uh, called upon. So that is to say, you know, a guarantee is put in place for 10 years to say, well, we've solved your Japanese knotweed problem. And if not, the guarantee says uh, we will come back and, and uh, resolve it. But to the best of my knowledge, uh, I can't really share any quantitative data with you. But when I carry out membership uh, meetings and visits, uh, I always pose the question, you know, how's it going with guarantee claims? And there are very, very few. So to me, that means we're winning. We, we are winning that battle. Um, but as I said earlier on, when we get out into the wild, I mean, you know, everywhere you look, I mean, any walk I go on in the countryside, perhaps, you know, my eyes are tuned in a little bit. But I know Andy is the same. Every time Andy goes out for a walk, he sends me a picture of giant hogweed or Himalayan balsam or you know, so. No, we're definitely not winning that battle. But that's not mm. quantitative. And I apologize for that. You know, a question has just come in from Mike Palmer, which is quite interesting, especially with all that's going on at the moment in time in Europe with the heat waves, the droughts, etc. Um, he's interested in your view in that with climate change, heats, droughts, colds, rains, floods, can you see a greater encouragement of growth of invasive plants such as Japanese knotweed and other non-native invasive weeds? Can you see the growth becoming crazy 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, say, say, say two, 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 two things about extreme climate. I would say is one is they're very it's very disruptive to the status mm. quo. So you've got you've got your natural habitats, you've got your wild um, species, you know, established communities of plants, insects, and animals. And when you get extreme weather, whether it be extreme cold or extreme heat or floods mm. or whatever, you know, you're 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 disturbing the uh, harmony if you like of, of that and invasive species love that you know mm. they're absolutely geared up ready to rock and roll you know whenever the opportunity presents itself they will come in and occupy any niche within a habitat which is no longer being occupied by a successful native plant or, or insect community so mm. I, I think the extreme weather uh, patterns will increase the risk of invasive species new invasive species coming in or existing invasive species becoming more problematic. In terms of uh, whether, let's say this summer, this very hot summer in the southern half of England and all of Europe, mainland Europe, um, I think Japanese knotweed is a clear winner, absolute clear winner. Now I've seen some stressed Japanese knotweed plants over the last two months, you know, lacking for water, you know, showing a little bit of wilt and scorch around the leaves clearly not happy but what i'll tell you andy is that japanese knotweed is the least badly affected plant mm. herbaceous plant that is i mean most woody mm. species seem to be doing okay you know they they can they can tolerate these droughts because they've got very very extensive root systems but most herbaceous plants that re rely on gathering water fairly near the surface of the soil mm. uh have been completely decimated this summer they probably haven't set seed a lot of them whereas japanese knotweed i would say you know, it's it's fine. It it will survive. It might not have done very well in terms of spread of growth this year, but it will come back next year. And it's raining now. Here we are getting into September. We get a lot of rain. I mean, it can put on a, 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 a lot of growth between now and November and it will do. So, uh, yeah, I think Japanese knotweed is definitely winning because of the extreme weather. Well, folks, so just to let everyone know, we are running about five minutes over here. I'm going to try and get as many questions in as I can. So, Peter, if you can just um, if you can just make these um, any questions just short and sweet as best you can. The next question is going to be a bit of a challenge, though, and it kind of leans on the lending industry. But an interesting question from Andrew Turner. Um, he he mentions that you seem very certain in your comment that the that the industry is now comfortable with the latest guidance on Japanese knotweed, but speaking on behalf of a lender there still seems like there's very difficult decisions that need to be made, not least because of a comment that you made that it's never a hundred percent, you can never be a hundred percent confident that Japanese knotweed won't come back. What can we do for the lending industry that can potentially give them more confidence above and beyond what has recently been published? Uh, yeah. You I mean, thanks very much for that question, Andrew. Um, the um, two things I think I can say, I mean, obviously, as far as lending policy is concerned, we, we don't try and second guess, you know, what, what, uh, what, what, how lenders should behave or act. Uh, all, all we can do is we have a very clear set of guidance from RICS, which enables valuers uh, and building surveyors to report to lenders about the what we now call management categories for Japanese knotweed and there's very clear it's very clearly stated in the RICS guidance what that means so if they say it's category A or category B or category C or category D there is an extrapolation from that in terms of the guidance for the lender so what to do what action to take whether to you know um uh, take it take this into account in the valuation or the lending decision or or not you know but in in every case even at the lower down level say category c and d you know the guidance is still that the uh, the property owner should be um, encouraged to to take action to, to control the knotweed if it's present but it's a nuanced uh, set of guidelines which takes account of the location of the knotweed in relative to whether it is or isn't causing any big problems the amount of knotweed uh, and its proximity to boundaries and that sort of thing. Um, I think the whole issue of dormancy, though, the whole issue of, you know, when is not we dead uh, is, is something that, you know, we've been discussing on and off since forever. And uh, the thing is, with changes in herbicide legislation, with changes in, in, in sort of regulations around herbicide control, um, 
you know, we are in a position whereby we can confidently suppress uh, the growth of Japanese knotweed in the soil without disturbing the soil. Um, and we're so confident about that that we can issue 10 year guarantees on it. Now, it might be that we're confident enough to issue 15 or 20 year guarantees on it, but the insurance industry won't let us because they're not geared up to do 15 or 20 year guarantees in, in that property, in that sector. So it's, it's not really a decision that we've made to say, well, it only works for 10 years. That's far from it. Uh, that's that's just a, a function of the insurance market. Um, and uh, I mean, I think really the answer to the question is that if a property has had a knotweed management plan and it's been successful and there's been no claims under the guarantee, uh, it's probably prudent at the end of that guarantee period to, uh, you know, to have some kind of precautionary check made to make sure that it isn't coming back and not likely to come back. Um, but herbicide treated knotweed rhizomes present in the soil seem to retain the potential to regrow in the future, but it all depends on so many variables. We can't begin to discuss, discuss them now. Sometimes it will never happen. Other times it, it does. Um, quantifying it is a problem. Uh, anecdotally, I would say that dorm, uh, herbicide induced dormancy can break, um, you know, in the longer term. Um, so, but it all just depends on how much rhizome there was to start with how much foliage there was, in other words, how much herbicide got into the rhizome network. Uh, and these are variables that we often don't have much control over. So it's, it's, it's not an absolutely perfect situation, but it's 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 working. Right, Peter, um, we're, 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 running, we're running major over time. Sorry, folks, I'm going to pose one last question to you, Peter, but if you can really make it as short as possible. Yeah. Um, now, this one actually comes from Nick Simpson, but it has come from other people as well. Um, He's asking, Peter, um, in, my, in his mind, Himalayan balsam is a far more prevalent um, invasive plant than, say, Japanese knotweed. In your opinion, is this going to be a growing problem? And potentially, is Himalayan balsam the new Japanese knotweed? Uh, well, you asked for a short answer. The short answer is no. <laughs> um, it mainly, mainly because it's just a herbaceous uh, weed. It doesn't produce woody or fibrous growths. It doesn't produce permanent vegetative structures in the soil. So it doesn't cause disruption to disturbance. I mean, it's a massive problem in the environment. Absolutely massive. And a lot of wildlife landowners and wildlife organizations are expending huge amounts of effort and energy to try and get on top of the Himalayan balsam problem. But in the property sector, when you say, is it the new Japanese knotweed? In the property sector, definitely not, because it doesn't really cause the disruptive impact uh, of things like bamboo and Japanese knotweed. Uh, but whilst I'm on the subject of Budlia, oh no, that was in Himalayan balsam, wasn't it? But can I just answer a question from Tim? Uh, he said, I thought Budlia was nectar poor because I mentioned Budlia earlier on. Uh, and it's not nectar poor, no, it's, it's nectar rich and, and butterflies and insects do use that nectar. But the problem is that none of those butterflies and moths uh, can lay their eggs on it because the foliage of Budlia is not a, a food plant for caterpillars. So overall, it has a negative ecological impact, not a positive one. All righty. Well, folks, if you have posed the question, we haven't had the chance to ask it. Um, what I will do is I will pass those questions over to Peter. And I can't promise anything, but if you can um, answer it, then I'm sure he will. If you are watching the replay and you do have a question, um, if you just want to simply email me, andy at property-care.org, that's andy at property-care.org, I will do my utmost to try and make sure that question is answered for you. Um, just for those that are potentially looking for more information and guidance, I just wanted to point you over to a couple of resources. Starting off, you can go to our PC Invasive Weed Technical Doc Library, the link is on the screen. Um, you can also visit our professional guidance pages and CPD videos. Those links are on the screen as well. But we do have, um, there is some useful books that we would recommend as well. First one being the practical management of invasive non-native weeds in Britain and Ireland. I appreciate that there's people on from Europe there, but that's not to say that you wouldn't gain a lot of information from that book. But there is also a, a new book that was out quite recently, Invasive Bamboos, Their Impact and Management in Great Britain and Ireland. Now, just for those that are interested in the links to CPD videos, the, the technical doc library, I have just put the links to 
those um those assets those those um areas of additional information just within the chat just feel free to click on those links for further information and for those that are interested in learning uh, uh even more there is training courses that you can go on and within the pc we have training courses both for surveyors and technicians on the management of japanese not we both classroom based and online based but we also have a whole series of additional new training courses that we have brought to the table that are all online, starting there with our safe and sustainable or use of herbicides, completely free for PCA members, only £30 for non-members. There's the bamboos and other invasive grasses and also our invasive woody shrubby trees and climbers. Um, just a reminder for those that didn't hear at the beginning of the webinar, we do have our upcoming International Invasive Weed Conference coming up. Um, it is the, the final, pro well, the almost final program is now live on the website. I've just stuck a link into the chat for anyone that is interested. You can find out all the information there. And if you so chose to do so, you can also book online for the conference also. Um, just before we go, um, just to let you know, next webinar coming up, which will be on the 29th of September. This time we're switching more to the damp and timber sector. Um, and it's all about the investigation of moisture and its effects on traditional buildings. And this comes off the back of the joint statement and methodology between the PCA Historic England and the Royal, and the Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors. More information will be coming out on this shortly. Last but not least, I just want to say a big thank you for everyone who joined us this morning and to everyone that is watching the replay of this. Um, a big thank you to you, Peter, for the presentation and sharing your information. And last but not least, just there, uh, I just want to say good morning to everyone and I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.